Anytime you can find a fragmented industry consisting primarily of mom and pop owners, and I'm going to say this and it's going to maybe hurt some feelings, but unsophisticated mom and pop owners without the systems, the processes, the technology, or the capital backing to really turn it into a professionally run business, it is ripe for someone to come in and consolidate. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. My guest today has raised over $8 million in private money, and he has been involved in all kinds of real estate, just about every way possible that you can think of from auctions, foreclosures, fix and flips, rentals, hard money, syndication, buying houses subject to the existing note, lease options, brokerage, self-directed IRAs, commercial assets. I mean, you name it, he's been a part of it. And now, his most recent ventures and interest and favorite part about real estate investing today is actually expanding in his investments in laundromat facilities. I hear that laundromats can like print money for you. I'm not sure. But in just a moment, you're going to be meeting my guest, Sam Wilson, right after this. Well, Sam, to get the show kicked off, I mean, my lands, you've raised over $8 million in private money, and, and this is raising private money um, uh, for, you know, for your real estate deals. This is what we talk about on the show. And so first of all, what was it, in, what, what part of real estate was it? Take us back to when you first started raising private money. Why did you start raising private money and for what kind of deals was it? I started raising private money. Well, I mean, like the rest of us, at some point we run out of our own capital. And so I started raising private money when we were buying houses at the foreclosure auctions. Those were all cash transactions. Uh, you had to show up to the courthouse steps, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in your pocket and cashier's checks in order to buy those assets right then and there. Uh, and I had to have, you know, private money to do that. So that's really where I started was actually just getting promissory notes, unsecured promissory notes from friends and family and anybody else I could convince that I was going to put their money to good use uh, and paying them, paying them handsomely for that. And then I would just go and use that at the uh, foreclosure auctions. Right. Well, your story is similar to mine. Um, <laughs> I started using private money back in 2009 um, when I ran out of money at the bank. <laughs> mm. in, mm -hmm. in other words, in, in other words, I was relying on, you know, my local bank to fund my deals and uh, called them up, had a couple of deals on the contract. And I learned my line of credit had been shut down. Of course, we know what was going on in 2007, eight and nine. Well, Sam, yep. take us back to that first private lender that, uh, that started loaning you money um, how did you approach them? How did that conversation go? Cause you know, our listeners here on the show are all the time wanting to know, how do you start a conversation with a potential private lender? And, and, you know, what should that conversation sound like in order to end up having someone do business with you as a lender? I, I would say that conversation in the beginning was full of fear and trepidation even though I knew what I was doing at that point and had uh, a reasonable track record behind me, I'd never really gone to anybody else to raise money or ask them for money or tell them how to structure the deal. I remember writing up our own kind of in-house promissory note that I borrowed from somebody else and tweaking it to, to, you know, I don't recommend this necessarily, but tweaking it to where it made sense for the both of us and just saying, Hey, here's what I'm going to do with this. And here's the, the, uh, the term at which I'm going to borrow the, the, the determined rate at which I'm going to borrow the, uh, the funds and then you know after the races we went you know that conversation would be very different i think today but i don't want to get maybe necessarily into the weeds on that unless you want to go down that rabbit hole 
Oh, let's go down that rabbit hole because, I mean, you know, what's relevant is today. So if you were to start having a conversation with a potential private lender, you know, how would you start that conversation and how would you approach it today versus, you know, when you did the very first time? Yeah, I, I, I would approach it very differently. One, I'd put a deal deck together. It'd be one of the first things I'd do. I'd say, hey, look, here are all of the things that we are investing in or that we will be investing in. Depends on, depend on how they were, you know, being secured in the asset. You know, again, if it was buying at the courthouse steps, there's not really a good way to give them security in the asset until after we've already spent the money, which is kind of a, you know, that's a, that's a nuance and somebody's got to know you very well. Uh, on the other side, though, uh, I would put a, I would put a very nice deal deck together that shows one what our track record is, what our history is, the types of assets we've bought, what we own right now, our performance to other investors. Have we ever lost money? I might even put things in there like you know top ten mistakes I've made in real estate because I think anytime you can tell the truth about who you are and what you know, uh, that just that that instills confidence I think in investors when you can say, hey, here's here's some things we've done wrong in the past, and here's how we're, how we mitigate that risk going forward, maybe not necessarily things you've done wrong, but at least put a risk mitigation plan in that deck as well. So those are some of the things I would think through if I were to approach you and say, Jay, I'm, I'm you know, I'm raising a million dollars and here's what we're going to do with that money. And here's something to protect your asset. So, or your, your interest in the, uh, in the asset. So sure. yeah, that, that's where I'd start. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, what comes to my mind is, you know, when I'm, when I'm talking with a new potential private lender, one thing that I learned at the very beginning about raising private money was to separate the conversation between what my program is, what I pay my private lenders, how they're protected, how they can get their money back early in case of an emergency. And I teach them my program. You know, the, the beautiful thing about the way that at least I approach uh, private money is that I can't be rejected because I'm not raising money for a particular deal. You know, mm. I've learned, I've learned over the years, the, 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 the worst time to be trying to attract money is when you need it for right. a particular deal. Right. Yep. Um, yep. So I separate the activities of, of uh, teaching people the program, you know, the old traditional way of borrowing money is you go to the bank and get on your hands and knees and put your hands underneath your chin and you beg and you say, please fund my deal, please fund my deal. And you know, in this world, we're not doing that. Instead of asking for a mortgage, I'm actually offering a mortgage. So, mm. uh, and, and plus, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, if, you, if, if you're teaching your private lending program or, and then you talk about a deal in the same conversation, unfortunately, most of the time you already sound like you're begging and you're desperate if they've never loaned you money before. But right. you know, when I, when I, I call it putting it in the queue, like they tell me they've got, you know, X number of dollars, 150,000, 200,000, whatever dollars, I say, okay, well, I'm going to put you in the queue and put your money to work for you just as soon as possible. And then I call them up within a, you know, two weeks or so. And I say, I got great news. I can now put your money to work. Then, you know, it's like, I'm not chasing, I'm not begging. I'm actually offering them an opportunity. You, you agree with that philosophy and outlook? I do. I do. And our business model, you know, has changed in the commercial real estate space to, uh, unfortunately, it's probably a little bit different than what you're doing in that now we are raising on a per deal basis on rather large real estate syndications. So, you know, we've moved from that private money model and it's still private money and it's still syndications and it's still investments in the actual assets, but now it is on a per asset basis. But I will say that we are constantly, to your point, reaching out to investors, talking to investors, engaging with them, even if we don't have live deals to let them know what it is we're working on, the types of things we're working on, so that when the time comes, they are prepped and ready to make that investment uh, as opposed to just going going in cold. Sure. And you make a great point. To your point, Sam, attracting money for syndication or, or raising a large pool of money for a larger pro project, then obviously that is a different, um, that is a different approach versus you know, having funding, you know, for a single family house. Well, I know you want to talk about laundromats and I do too, but before we do, let's give away a gift, uh, Sam. I've got a new private money guide called seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate business, help you build incredible wealth. You can download this private money guide for free. It'll get you on the fast track to private money, never missing out on a deal for not having the funding. You can download this for free at jayconnor.com 
forward slash money guide. And that's with an ER, not an O-R, J Connor, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash money guide. Download that for all the private money that you Let's talk about the laundromat industry, Sam. I know absolutely nothing about the laundromat industry. So first of all, why do you believe this is a good investment opportunity? Why is investing in laundromats a good opportunity? We have invested in practically every commercial real estate asset class. I know you gave that there in the introduction from multifamily, self-storage, land, parking, RV resorts. I've touched all, I think, except for industrial and office space. And those are the only two maybe that I have yet. Well, you were and smart those... not to do the office space since everybody's on Zoom now. Correct. Correct. But even in, well, outside of, I'm doing office space conversions right now as a passive investor, not as an active investor. That's just, that's passive investments for me. Um, turning those into storage, which is a fun, fun project to see, uh, see go down. But I digress. I say all that to say that why is right now a good time to invest in the laundromat space? Anytime you can find a fragmented industry consisting primarily of mom and pop owners, and I'm going to say this and it's going to maybe hurt some feelings, but unsophisticated mom and pop owners without the systems, the processes, the technology, or the capital backing to really turn it into a professionally run business, it is ripe for someone to come in and consolidate. So that's one. Th that, that's thought number one is that it's a very fragmented industry. Uh, thought number two is one well, of Sam, our. Before, Sam, before you go to thought number two, how is a fragmented? What is it about an industry being fragmented? First of all, I want you to define that. What is what is a fragmented industry? And then secondly, what about a fragmented industry offers opportunity? A fragmented industry is something that has uh, it's it's largely owned by individual owners. So it's something where Jay would own a store, Sam owns a store, the next guy down the street owns a store. There's not any institutional ownership or large group ownership of these assets. Um, so that's a fragmented industry. What was your second question, Jay? What makes that an opportunity? Right. Economies of scale. So when you own a single store, you can't afford a full-time maintenance person a general manager or a regional manager, you can't afford to bring on all the staff that you need to make it run as a sophisticated business. You also don't probably have the capital backing to do the necessary capital expenditures to improve or, or invest in technology or invest in all the things that make a store go round and actually become a very professionally run organization. For you, you might say, gosh, Sam, putting a million dollars in equipment and payment systems in a store? I only own one store. You're like, I'm however old you are, Mr. Owner. Mr. Owner, let's say he's 55 years old and he's thinking to himself, you know, I kind of like the $80,000 a year I'm making on this store. Putting a million dollars into, that's a lot of money and that's a big payment. And I think I'll just, you know, ride this thing out for as long as it keeps making money. And then one day I'll sell it. And by the time they sell it, they've run it into the ground. And it's, you know, the value of it's gone to almost nothing because the NOI you know, is just falling off a cliff. So. That said, I'll just go back to the first statement of economies of scale. If we buy 10 stores in an area, I can now afford a regional manager. I can now afford a full-time maintenance person. We can get full-time maintenance trucks. We can get vehicles. We can get in-house delivery, uh, you know, delivery drivers. We can get all of these things that, you know, 10 stores can support, but one may not be able to. So that is, that is one of the key reasons why it is just ripe for consolidation is because there's just not... There's just not that large owner. There are a few, but there's not the uh, broad-based large ownership groups out there that have really taken this on. And you may, you know, you'd have to wonder why. And I don't, I don't completely know the answer as to why. I just know how the business works. I know the return profiles of the business, and I'm really excited about it because it's it is it's an inflation resistant, recession resistant asset class behind food and shelter. The third thing most humans want is clean clothing. And the demographic mm -hmm. that uses laundry facilities today don't stop using laundry facilities the worse the economy gets. In fact, they start using them more. So it's it's just a it's a really neat business to be involved in, and it's a neat opportunity to come in and really bring not just sophistication but also 
I mean, think about this, Jay. Like, why are we? St- why, why does the term coin laundry still exist? Why are we putting quarters in machines? I mean, you you can pay by phone. You can pay by phone. You can sit in your car and have the machine tell you when it's done running so you can come back inside and get your laundry out and move it over to the dryer if you want. But 99% of the stores out there don't have that basic technology. Like we're, we're going, we're getting rid of the coins in a coin laundry because I mean, it's not 1965 anymore. There's no reason to put, <laughs> I mean, most of our machines are nine and 10 bucks a piece to start anymore. Why are we putting 40 quarters in a machine? This is, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. And that's what you find almost almost entirely across the industry. So those are just small things I look at and go, and, and we're getting rewarded. I, I'm, I'm just blabbermouthing here, but we're getting rewarded handsomely for going into these stores and putting a million dollars in equipment and putting in brand new equipment, making them brand, you know, just top to bottom, you know, retrofitting these stores, automatic doors that unlock, bright lights that never go off, fully attended, brand new equipment, payment systems, loyalty card systems. I mean, you know, just all this stuff that, kind of goes into making a uh, a new experience for the end user of a laundry facility. And um, yeah, it's working out really well. That is awesome. So, you know, from a, what, did, what would you say, Sam, is your overall investment strategy and how does investing in laundromats fit into that strategy? Yeah. So, uh, my overall, and this is, this has been something I have learned the hard way. My overall investment strategy personally for the last three or four years has been highly opportunistic. And by that, I mean, I know enough people in the industry. I run a real estate podcast. I get deals sent to me all the time. And it was just kind of fun for me where it was like, Hey, you know, I got this really cool, uh, multifamily complex. You want to join, join us on this? And I'd say, yeah, sure. That'd be fun. We'll go down and buy a multifamily apartment. And then we go buy self storage. Then you, you heard that in my bio, and, and I, I would say in the for better or worse equation, it's probably been on the for worse side of things, just because it hasn't been a very uh, laser focused thing. So there's there's one thing I've done uh, probably not very well is being highly focused. So my overall investment strategy, especially right now, we're recording this. What this is April fourth of twenty twenty three, is one downside protection. So that's that's step one. I think that's one thing investors and myself are, are particularly concerned about right now is the loss of loss of capital and or being highly focused on capital preservation. So that's step one. Uh, step two is finding an asset that we can reprice with inflation. And that, and 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 unlike a, a long term lease on a multifamily project or even a triple net lease, you know, that doesn't reset for five years. I can change prices at our stores like a gas station. It takes me about 30 seconds and I can reprice an entire store, which again, your mom and pop owners can't do because they got to go to each machine and program them. But for me, I can do it right here from my computer while I'm talking to you. Um, so, so, so it needs to be inflation resistant. And then thirdly, it needs to be recession resistant. I already talked about that. So it's something that in the overall investment strategy, oh, and it needs to produce a double digit cash on cash return to both my investors and to me. So if it, if it, and I know that sounds like a, it's like a pie in the sky dream, but the laundry facility business will do all of those things for me. Um, so yeah, that's that's the strategy right now. If it meets those four metrics, I'm in, and the laundry business is it. And so that's really where we are going long. Yeah, you just touched on it just a little bit, but uh, I'd like to get a little granular and specific. So. In you know, in, when investing in laundromats, what kind of returns are you typically looking for in an investment like this? Yeah, it's a great question. I will give you more of the industry, uh, kind of the industry wide return profiles, because you, you, I don't want to get granular into the splits between investors and general partners and this and that. We don't have time this, to get into all that, but on an industry wide return on investment, cash on cash, annual return on investment, it's 25 to 35%. Wow. And we found that to be true. We've, I've, I've, yeah, very, very healthy. Um, and, and we're, I'm living proof of it. I can tell you that from, from the stores that we own right now, that that's absolutely the way it works. Um, you know, and as a, so you know, I don't, but that hopefully that answers your question. Was that? Oh, it does. I mean, a, a 25% return, <clears throat> is that's phenomenal. I mean, phenomenal. Regardless, regardless of any kind of 
you know, asset uh, class that you're in, that you're investing in. Well, and you know, and no matter what we do in business, there's risk. There's risk involved in in everything we do. So, what would you say? What kinds of risk are perhaps associated with investing in um, laundromat facilities, and how do you mitigate those risks? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I will start with the positive news. The positive news is that we have a 95% industry-wide success rate in the laundromat business. That means nine and a half out of 10 laundromats that go into existence are profitable laundromats, which is an astounding that, statistic. That's amazing. Yeah. Compared to the restaurant business, I don't know what it is, but I mean, if I were it's to you know, take a <laughs> low, I'd put it at maybe three and a half or four out of 10 restaurants <laughs> end up being wildly successful. So that's the good news. Laundry facilities thrive in areas where laundry facilities are needed. So just think about that for a second and go, okay, there's a certain subset, there's a certain demographic, there's a certain area of town where laundromats are needed. They're not going to be in the areas of town where the median home selling price is two and a half million dollars. It's just not where they're going to thrive. So you get the attendant problems that go along with that. Just let your imagination run wild. There's, you know, everything from crime to, you know, just stupid stuff, homeless people. I mean, you name it and we've seen it happen. I got more stories from laundromat ownership. You just go, really? That actually, there's humans that, that, yes, it happened. Indeed it did. But the good news is, is that generally that amount of stupid is easy to fix. Okay, so a bunch of punk kids came in and decided to graffiti the walls. Okay, there's a few hundred bucks. Get the painter in there, paint the walls. I mean, oh, everybody stole the plants in the store. Okay, well, we got to go back to Lowe's and buy new buy new green plants and put them on top. I mean, you run an actual business, you run a contract, I ran a contracting business for a decade and we lost a whole lot more money than some plants and some graffiti in that business with some projects that went wrong with some deals that didn't go as planned, things like that. So overall, I can deal with a little bit of that stupid. I just call it stupid because that's what it is. The stupid stuff happens. That's one of the risks I would say is that you just got to be kind of put your game face on or some of that kind of just nonsense. Um, outside of that, I mean, gosh, I, I maybe maybe I should be thinking a little bit more critically here. But I mean, obviously, you could over improve a store. Maybe I haven't seen that happen yet. But um, you know, the risk of the risk of the business folding or going under would probably be more uh, a sign of the operator and less of the business itself. Um, you know, the area, again, areas where laundromats thrive, they're not gentrifying that fast. So, you know, you don't have to worry about necessarily the next day your, your once was laundromat neighborhood becoming a, uh, again, a two and a half million dollar, uh, medium home selling price area. So those are a lot of things that, uh, maybe come to mind immediately. Well, the, <clears throat> on the big picture, you know, when you got a 95%, uh, success rate, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, that in and of itself uh, sort of mitigates the risk with you having that kind of a uh, success rate. So <clears throat> as you were talking, another question came to mind, and and that was, is your investment strategy in laundromats, are you looking for existing laundromats that you want to buy? And like, you know, I rehab houses. You're going to rehab, you're going to buy it and rehab um, you know, the laundromat and bring it up to, you know, today's standards of with all the technology that you were talking about. Are you building them from the ground up or all the above? Speed to market is a, an important um, component here in, in this business. And the lowest hanging fruit right now is existing stores. Because again, it being a largely mom and pop owned business, Yes, I do at some point want to start developing and building ground up laundromats. We're not there yet just because there's so much lower hanging fruit where we can go in and buy an existing store. I mean, the time it takes to build out a store properly to get all the, you know, the mechanicals, the electrical, the plumbing, everything set just right. I mean, that's a that's a long endeavor and it's a very expensive endeavor. And a lot of times you can buy those already all that infrastructure in place at far below replacement cost just because the business itself has been run into the ground. So, I mean, the value of the business is really what, you know, just a, a factor of its net operating income. 
So yeah, speed to market is, is one of the things we really focus on. And also just, you know, the, the, the expense of getting to that market. So building ground up, yes, it's something that I think we will then tackle maybe on in phase two of our business. But right now there's just ample opportunity in existing stores. Right. What's your marketing uh, look like as far as finding sellers or motivated sellers of laundromats? That's a great question. And that's something that's constantly in test. We're constantly revising, reviewing how many letters we sent out this week, how many phone calls we made, how many stores we visited, how many letters we dropped off in person. The by far and away uh, most effective marketing channel for us is visiting, visiting a store in person. So we will just go and, and a lot of times even the owner may not be there, but that's okay. We're going to drop off a letter for that owner right there and leave it with whoever's working there or leave it on the desk or slide it under the door somewhere, leave it where somebody that has keys to the building is going to walk in and find it and go, Oh, Hey, you know, Sam stopped by and he's curious about my laundromat and see, would like to see if we're interested in selling by far and away the uh, most time consuming, but also the most effective marketing that we have done to date. Yeah. So you're, so what you're saying is your most effective marketing method is knocking on doors. Bingo. You got it, man. <laughs> you got it. I love it. And we've, well, we've we've done loads of mail. We've done loads of phone calls. We've done loads of everything. And the best thing we've done with the fastest, most effective results has just been knocking on doors. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of laundromats, uh, I mean, just my own personal observation, some of them are standalone stores. Um, some of them are renting space in a, you know, shopping center kind of thing. Um, does it matter to you? Or do you have a preference as to whether you're investing in um, a business that's renting space or otherwise? Well, we will take a store on a lease. Certainly. I would prefer to own the real estate always. I want to control it if we can. I mean, that's, that just, that's kind of the number one rule I think is to control the, uh, control the real estate. So we do have stores on leases and those, those are fine. Um, but always with the understood objective, even with the landlord, the day we sign a lease, I want to buy the whole facility. Uh, mm -hmm. and that can be, and these, these can oftentimes be found, and this is kind of a, a secondary part of the mm -hmm. business, but they can be found in a retail strip center, right? So you may mm -hmm. have a laundry facility, you may have a barber shop, you may have a ice cream store, you may have a liquor store, you may have any of these other kind of relevant last, I'm not gonna call them last mile, but they're businesses that you can't Amazon that are all right there. And it's like, well, why don't we buy the whole building? And that, that too is a, is a component of what certainly what we're doing. So yes, is the answer to both. Okay, cool. So <clears throat> when you buy these, of course, capital's needed, right? Mm -hmm. um, you like me, we raise money. Uh, we attract money. Uh, we attract lenders and investors. So what kind of capital investment is required to purchase and operate these type of facilities? And how are the funds raised? That's a great question. It is, it, it, I'm going to use a number and say it's roughly a million dollars a store. By the time you, if it's a standalone store, by the time you buy the store, put all your equipment in, you're going to be all in for about a million bucks if you're doing it right. And it's the size of facility that we want. That is also, it can vary wildly. Um, just because let's assume we go back to the retail strip center. Like maybe it's a really mm -hmm. nice retail strip center and maybe there's a laundromat and maybe there's a car wash attached to it as well. So again, things that we would buy would include all of those because it's, well, this just kind of fits the you know laundromat being the anchor tenant, if you will. And the other things being kind of ancillary revenue streams that go right alongside of it. So that number could be two and a half million bucks. I mean, it's really hard to say, but I would say on an average, if I'm just, just throwing a dart, at the uh, dartboard, I'd say on, a, on an average deal, it's going to be roughly a million dollars out the door by the time you've got a store completely retrofitted and ready to go the way you want it. So I got you. that said, how are we raising the capital for that? We are actually just on, in the, on, on the front end uh, of launching a fund. And this fund will go out. It's going to be a, roughly a $10 million laundry fund. We will go out and acquire assets. We may or may not take on debt. That's one of the things that's kind of fun. Is it fun? excuse me, that's one of these kind of fun inside of this business is that we don't even necessarily have to take on debt in order to make it a very profitable business. So that's one of the things we're kicking around right now. It's like, well, we can raise private capital for this, 
put it inside of the, buy these assets inside of the fund. And if we ever decide that we want to go out and leverage them, we can, or we cannot. Obviously, the more leverage you take on, you know, the greater risk you assume, but also the greater your returns can be. And so that's something we're kind of kicking around right now that's not completely um, ironed out yet. But that's certainly, uh, certainly um, one of the things that we're looking at. So <clears throat> I was going to ask, do you have investment opportunity right now? Uh, if someone's interested in passive income and not having to look for deals and negotiate deals and just wants to sit back and if they may have retirement funds and they want to invest some of those retirement funds, you know, they can transfer them over to a self-directed IRA company and then invest with you. Um, how would they reach out to you and find out more about your investment opportunity and the kind of returns they can get? Go to BrickenInvestmentGroup.com. That's B-R-I-C-K-E-N InvestmentGroup.com forward slash join. And join our, join our Brick and Investor Club. That's how you get notified of all the opportunities that we have coming up. We will have the Laundry Fund launched probably in the next 30 to 45 days. And there'll be ample opportunity inside of that. We've already got a, a, a pool of stores that are going to go into and including both the, the uh, businesses and the real estate going into that fund like five or six stores already that are uh, lined up to go into that fund. It's going to be, it's going to be a, a great opportunity, I think, on that front to get into the laundry business. So again, go to brickandinvestmentgroup.com forward slash join, and you can hear all about our opportunities. That is great. Sam, thank you so much for taking the time to join me here on Raising Private Money. Um, you're my first laundromat guy. <laughs> Good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad, glad to be of service. Thank you again for having me on, Jay. This was loads of fun. <laughs> Absolutely. You got it. Well, there you have it. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, also known as the Private Money Authority. And we really appreciate the uh, subscribes and the follows. If you happen to be listening on iTunes, just click those three dots and uh, click on follow. If you're watching on YouTube or uh, Facebook, any of our other live streaming channels, uh, be sure on YouTube to ring that bell so you don't miss out on any of the other upcoming amazing episodes. So I'm looking forward to seeing you right here on the next amazing episode of Raising Private Money. And I'm Jay Connor, wishing you all the best. And here's to taking your business to the next level. See you right here next time. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money.